returning to calm. Underlying tensions remain, but Baltimore streets are quiet tonight. Advocating for women, a passionate Pope Francis takes a stand on equal pay for equal work. Capitol Hill first, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe addresses a joint session of Congress. And gone are the Hojos. Those clam plates and 28 flavors of ice cream have all but disappeared. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Wednesday, April 29th, 2015. Good evening from Washington. Thanks for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick with your news now. Baltimore picks up the pieces today after Monday night's riots and looting. Schools reopened and the Orioles played baseball, albeit with no fans in the stands. Jason Calvi is back in Baltimore tonight where tensions are easing. Brian, 3,000 police and guardsmen are trying to keep the peace, making sure we don't have a repeat of what happened Monday. The rioting, the looting, breaking into stores like the one behind me. They did have a curfew all night long until 5 this morning with little accounts of disturbance. Now, here at St. Bernardine's Catholic Church in Baltimore, the message is clear. Pray and help clean up. They take my cigars, candies. That's all I have. Looters left a mess for Khan Javid Monday night. There's one guy standing right there. Then Tuesday morning, he was held up. St. Bernardine staff are cleaning up Javid's yeah, convenience store and repairing the damages. Across the street, the doors of the parish have stayed open. To see those young men not hanging out on the corner, you know, not looting, not robbing, but to see them in church praising God, it was just awesome. This young man had a message for rioters. Like, all y'all doing is tearing our city up. Like, come on, what's the point of all that? How's that bringing justice? The riots began after the funeral of Freddie Gray, who mysteriously died in police custody. Monsignor Rich Bozelli says what the country saw earlier this week doesn't represent the city he knows. Baltimore is a, is a fabulous city. You know, the witness you're seeing of, of, of the churches, the communities coming together to clean up, to really try to calm the place down. I mean, I think that's the true Baltimore that uh, everybody really believes in. And for that, this shop owner is grateful. Thank you. And the prayers continue here at St. Bernardine Catholic Church in Baltimore. They're going to have a special collection for riot relief, which is going to take place this Sunday. Now, tonight in several parishes across the archdiocese, there are special masses for peace and justice scheduled. Brian? All right, thank you. Jason Calvi in Baltimore. And here in Washington, this most recent violence is concerning to leaders in office and those running for office. Suzanne LaFranchi has more from the White House tonight. Suzanne? Brian, the riots are giving politicians a chance to highlight their solutions to this ongoing police first community battle, and both sides of the aisle are seizing the opportunity to weigh in. We need to restore balance to our criminal justice system. In her first major policy address, Democratic presidential candidate Hillary Clinton used the violence in Baltimore to promote her proposed justice reforms for America. We need smart strategies to fight crime that help restore trust between law enforcement and our communities, especially communities of color. Clinton is calling for the use of police body cameras. She also advocates reducing the prison population by alternative punishments for low-level offenders. Yesterday, the president also said society needs to find a more long-term solution. We don't just pay attention when uh, a young man gets shot or has his spine snapped. We're paying attention all the time because we consider those kids our kids and we think they're important and they shouldn't be living in poverty and violence. Today, the White House press secretary says the Department of Justice is considering investing $75 million in body cameras. Police officers who are wearing body-worn cameras were much less likely to be involved uh, in uh, confrontations with members of the community. Republican presidential candidate Dr. Ben Carson is a lifelong Baltimore resident. In a Time Magazine op-ed, he wrote about the Baltimore riots, urging parents to take control of their children and embrace the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who said, I urge parents to take control of your children and embrace the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who said, returning violence for violence multiplies violence. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Attorney General Loretta Lynch says Baltimore is a city where police are trying to protect and peaceful protesters are trying to improve conditions. And the two sides, she said, are struggling to reach a balance. Brian. 
Thanks, Suzanne. The Baltimore Orioles host the Chicago White Sox today. It's believed to be the first ever Major League Baseball game to be played behind closed doors. Because of this week's riots, no fans were allowed inside Camden Yards. Games that had been scheduled Monday and Tuesday are postponed until next month, but Major League Baseball wanted at least one game of this series to be played this week. Local business owners say the riots in today's empty ballpark are bad for business. We're already trying to rebudget for the rest of the season. Um, it, you know, just the expenses to the city, it's, I don't even know how to explain it. It's just, it's monumental. The Orioles also moved their Friday to Sunday series against Tampa Bay to the Rays field, Tropicana Field in Florida. That means Baltimore will have only 78 home games this season compared with 84 on the road. Some of the other stories our EWTN News Nightly team has been covering in today's world. Pope Francis says it's scandalous that women earn less than men for doing the same job. During his general audience, the Pope also took issue with those who blame the crisis in families on women working outside the home. He's been devoting his weekly catechesis to different aspects of family life before October's Synod on the Family. The Holy Father says husband and wife must be complementary. Our Rome correspondent, Alan Holdren, is joining us. And Alan, this Holy Father can be very passionate about an issue when he believes in it. And today's audience was an example of that, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. He, uh, he spoke about this scandal of, uh, of inequality between men and women. He was speaking in the context of the complementary, complementarity between men and women, treating men and women as equals with equal rights. It's not to say that they are different, but it is to say that they, they should be treated in the same way. He said it's scandalous when a woman isn't paid as much as a man in the workplace. Uh, and and this, this builds on his words in favor of women uh, worldwide that he, he's made a point of doing during this pontificate. And these comments came in the context of his catechesis on the family. What did he talk about the family in terms, especially about marriage and its permanence? Well, he was speaking in particular about people who have a fear of failure, uh, that their marriage uh, may, may fail so they don't even bother, they don't even get married. He said young people don't believe in marriage or the family anymore in his perspective. So he says this needs to be addressed. It's not that they're not having children, he said, uh, solely per, for economic purposes. And he said that it's an insult against women to say that it's because of the emancipation of women and that women have entered the workplace. He said that this is the major cause and it's something that surely will be addressed in the Synod of the Family coming up, this fear of failure. And of course that Synod is this fall, immediately after his visit to Philadelphia for the World Meeting of Families. So we're sort of leading into this, aren't we? That's right, that's right. And uh, people here, insiders, are saying that this, this whole process of these Wednesday audiences, his addresses during the Wednesday audience, is just a, a process of preparation for what will be the outcome of the Synod. This, this is what the Pope wants to see uh, come from the Synod, is sp uh, speaking discussion about issues like marriage uh, for young people. Are they prepared to get married? Are they, are they well catechized? Do they know what the church teaches on marriage? Do they know that marriage is a sacrament? He's trying to, to push forward this Christian message of, of what the, 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 the sacrament of marriage actually is. So we're seeing that come through these, Christ, these uh, audiences from week to week, and uh, we will see, of course, a lot of discussion about that come October. And his comments getting a lot of attention. All right, Alan Holdren joining us from Rome. Thank you, Alan. Thanks, Brian. Nigeria's military moves nearly 300 women and girls from the place where they were held by Boko Haram terrorists. None of those rescued appear to be the Nigerian schoolgirls abducted more than a year ago. Many of the girls rescued from the forest stronghold are traumatized. The military is flying in teams to address both their physical and psychological health. Amnesty International says at least 2,000 women and girls have been taken by Boko Haram since 2014. Many are forced into sex slavery while others are trained to fight. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe today becomes the first Japanese leader to address a joint session of the U.S. Congress. He expressed deep remorse over the Second World War, offering condolences for American lives lost. His Capitol Hill remarks come 70 years after the war ended. History is harsh. What is done cannot be undone. With deep repentance in my heart, 
I stood there in silent prayers for some time. My dear friends, on behalf of Japan and the Japanese people, I offer with profound respect my eternal condolences to the souls of all American people that were lost during World War II. Abe lobbied for support for a 12-nation trans-Pacific trade pact that has divided Congress, provoking opposition in Japan as well. Ironically, fellow Democrats oppose President Obama on this issue, while many Republicans are supporting it. The U.S. economy skidded to a near halt in the first quarter of this year. That harsh winter, plunging exports, and sharp cutbacks in oil and gas drilling are being blamed. The Commerce Department says the overall economy grew by just 0.2%, that tiny increase is much worse than economists had expected. Analysts predict a solid rebound for the rest of the year. Coming up, as more aid arrives in Nepal, the earthquake death toll tops 5,000. And the convicted Boston Marathon bomber awaiting sentencing is described by a witness as a sweet kid growing up. Today, April 29th, is the Feast of St. Catherine of Siena, a doctor of the church. A trusted 14th century advisor to several popes, St. Catherine is the patroness of Europe, nurses, and television. Thanks for joining us on this Wednesday evening. I'm Brian Patrick. In the Colorado movie theater murder trial, the defendant's courtroom behavior is now under scrutiny. Prosecutors hint of something dark and calculating in the emotionless presence of James Holmes. His attorney says it is because of antipsychotic medication that he's on, Holmes pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity to the shootings in 2012 that killed 12 people and injured 70. Boston Marathon bombing trial jurors had shown or saw rather two photos of convicted bomber Johar Zanayev as a child. The son of his family's landlord testified today describing Zarnayev as a sweet kid. The witness says he did not have much contact with Zarnayev as he got older. That jury must decide if Zarnayev will let, get life in prison or the death penalty. Supreme Court justices spar today over the issue of capital punishment. They heard arguments in a case involving a drug that was used in several botched executions. Justice Samuel Alito accuses death penalty opponents of waging what he calls a guerrilla war against executions. Justice Elena Kagan contends that most executions amount to having prisoners burned alive from inside. Well, we won't know until June where the Supreme Court stands on the issue of redefining marriage. Of course, the church is clear that marriage is the union of one man and one woman open to life. Joining us by Skype from Dallas, Texas, Professor David Upham, who filed a brief in this week's Supreme Court hearing on the redefinition of marriage. Professor Upham is an attorney and an associate professor of politics at the University of Dallas. On behalf of whom did you file the brief and what do you address? I, I filed the brief on behalf of a, a variety of legal scholars, as well as the St. Thomas More Society of Dallas, a local attorney, uh, attorneys group. I filed the brief to, to highlight to the court and emphasize to the court that our traditions of liberty, including the traditions the court has long recognized in its own, in its own cases, pro, um, does not support the imposition of same-sex marriage by the courts. So in the past, courts have ruled that restricting marriage, for instance, based on uh, interracial uh, definition, that is unconstitutional. What is different about what we're dealing with now? Two things. Um, first, those cases vindicated the original understanding of the 14th Amendment, which was to abolish racial apartheid and establish a multiracial republic. Um, and there's plenty of early authority showing that that was what was intended. Secondly, What's asked for here is far more radical. The abolition of interracial marriage restrictions was a goal to abolish aberrational, peculiar things only some states. What's asked for here is the imposition of a new definition of marriage that is utterly unknown in the world, especially in the Western world, until the last few decades. So as in all court litigation, basically previous cases come into play here. How do you see previous cases playing into this scenario? If the court is faithful to its jurisprudence of the 20th century, it will say that the 14th Amendment secures rights long recognized at common law deep in our tradition, like freedom of speech or the right of parents to raise their own children. 
It will not, however, support their definition, the new definition of marriage. Professor David Upham joining us from the University of Dallas. Thank you so much for your expert analysis tonight. And thank you very much. And the death toll rises in Nepal as rescue crews try to help thousands impacted by Saturday's devastating earthquake. Wyatt Goolsby is here with the latest now. Brian, more than 5,000 people are dead and more than 10,000 people have been injured as a result of the earthquake. Some of the aid workers in Nepal say the relief effort will stretch on for months just to get everyone the food and shelter they need. Rescuers in Kathmandu know that time is running out. Their task, looking for survivors among the rubble. A sign of hope today, a 27-year-old man is rescued after being stuck for 80 hours. Tensions are high as thousands of people try to leave the capital. Many residents are fleeing to the countryside, but navigating the mountains outside the city is not easy. Landslides are blocking national highways, an enormous challenge to rescue and relief convoys. Community hospitals like this one are overrun. Our resources are limited, but still like our human resources, space, the medical supplies and our power backup, everything is limited, but we are trying to stretch everything as much as possible to provide the care to each and every patient to save their life. Back in the capital, international organizations move supplies. Catholic Relief Services sent us these photos of their workers surveying the damage. By and large, throughout the city and throughout Kathmandu Valley, uh, people are still afraid of the aftershocks and they're still sleeping outside. Uh, either that or they are seeing the condition of their house and they're unsure if it's safe to go inside to sleep at night or to go about during the day. So uh, just a lot of people are outside. CRS says it's vital aid groups work together in coordinating their efforts moving forward. Their goal? To provide 10,000 families with emergency shelter, blankets, and hygiene kits. Many aid organizations like Catholic Relief Services say if you want to help, it's best to donate money to a group you can trust. You can donate to organizations like CRS and Mercy Corps on their websites. Brian? All right. Thank you, Wyatt. Sadly, Nepal's prime minister says the death toll now at 5,200 will likely double. Here is an aerial view shot just today of the devastation. and Let us pray for all who are suffering there. The world divorced from God who created and redeemed it inevitably comes to a bad end. It's on the wrong side of the only history that finally matters. From the Cardinals column written by the late Cardinal Francis George in the fall of 2012, thanks for joining us on this Wednesday evening. I'm Brian Patrick. Dr. Trevor Lipscomb is the director of the Catholic University of America Press and publisher of Cardinal George's new book. And when did Cardinal George actually finish this very last book? Um, he was working on the page proof of the book about 10 days before he passed away and I'm told that he was sending an email regarding the book about four minutes after midnight uh, on the day that he passed away. That's amazing. What do we learn about this late faith leader from what he wrote in this book so close to his death? Um, I think this book is his literary legacy and what we learn from uh, it is that he has profoundly struggled um, in his life to integrate the faith, uh, the life of faith and reason. Um, the original subtitle was Wisdom and Discipleship, and the book really answers the questions he's been asking himself. They are faith journeys, as he says in the, the preface, that he has undertaken and that he wishes us to, to learn and reflect and, and be inspired by. Very deep reading. I understand that he is inspired by St. Augustine. Uh, very much so. I mean, St. Augustine was really a person who struggled with the moral life. He knew his faith and he sought the intellectual underpinnings of that faith and the reasons for the moral life. And so Augustine uh, is mentioned as a chapter, really, in the, uh, the book from Cardinal George. Cardinal George's predecessor, Cardinal Bernadine, wrote A Gift of Peace very close to the end of his life. Can you draw any comparison between these two? Yes, I think Cardinal Bernadine's uh, book was really far more personal in terms of stories of his life. Here, um, 
the questions that Cardinal George are ask, is asking are things such as what does it mean to be a Catholic intellectual? What is the meaning of, of Catholic education? Uh, what is a Catholic university? What makes it Catholic? Um, he's looking at how we take that faith that comes to us from the magisterium and how do we live that out? There's some who would say that he was at odds with Pope Francis. In fact, I believe he once said that Francis's papacy was perplexing to him. What did he write about that? Um, he has a beautifully phrased paragraph uh, early on in the book where he says uh, that Francis teaches by gestures. He said the wonderful thing about gestures is that they are universal. The problem with gestures as opposed to writing and proclamation is that they're liable to be misunderstood. He said Francis is really having a magisterium of ministry and he said if only uh, the book were written a year from now we would see more clearly uh, what uh, the, the magisterium un unfolds like uh, under Francis. Reflecting his beautiful openness, Cardinal George. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned his literary legacy. What do you think will be really the takeaway from this book? I think it's a challenge to all those who are in the Catholic intellectual life, for those who work in Catholic universities, such as the Catholic University of America. I mean, what does it mean to be a Catholic scholar, to strive to, to, uh, to live the life of faith? Not to say I have to check my brain at the church door every Sunday. Um, when will we see this book, A Godly Humanism Clarifying Hope That Lies Within? We are hoping to have uh, the book published by June 30th. Today we actually got the front, uh, the front cover for the first time, so that was uh, exciting for us, and uh, we're moving full steam ahead. I can't wait to read it. Dr. Trevor Lipscomb, thanks for joining us from Thank Seaway. You. Well, the signature Howard Johnson's orange roof was once commonplace along American highways, but no more. Remember Hojo's restaurants? There used to be hundreds of them. Big breakfasts, clam plates, 28 flavors of ice cream. It's a Sunday big as Mount Everest. Now the Lake George, New York Howard Johnson's is one of two left from a roadside empire that baby boomers like me grew up on. Hojo was magic. The building itself outside was magic with the colors and the roof line. Before McDonald's and other chains eclipsed Hojo's, families packed into station wagons for the promise of plentiful portions. But competition from other fast food outlets eventually took a toll on the slow to change chain. Hojo's have been closing for decades. In Bangor, Maine, the clock could be ticking on a restaurant that served its first clam plate in 1966. Well, when the, when the plate of clams came, you wondered how you were gonna eat it all. And the line behind us went out to the road. The Bangor restaurant has already scaled back its hours. A co-owner says it will close in a few weeks if he can't find someone to lease it. The Lake George restaurant was closed for several years when John LaRock stepped in. He liked serving up the same fried favorites and ice cream flavors from when he started here in the 1970s as a dishwasher and cook. Just try to keep it going. You know, it's been around for years and years since, you know, back in the 40s. LaRock ready to carry on the tradition as one of the last Hojo's standing. Howard Johnson. Wow, nostalgia. Until tomorrow, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. You can watch again on EWTN's YouTube page. For the EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Brian Patrick. Thank you so much for being with us. Here are some candid moments from today's general audience with Pope Francis as we say goodnight. God bless you.